It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the films of June 18th, 2004. And quite the opposite compared to what we had the week before, where we only had one really good movie out of four really terrible movies. We've got three movies in general here. Two really good films, and then one that probably won't go as far as to say it's bad, but I was really hoping for a lot more from it. We'll get to that one a little bit later on here, but let's get to the classics, the movies that really are... Not only some of the best movies, the best movies of this weekend, but easily the, some of the best movies of the year, honestly, and one of my favorite, some of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, starting off with the biggest new release of the weekend, uh, Vince Vaughn and Ben Stiller in Ross and Marshall Thurber's comedy Dodgeball: A True Underdog Story. God, what a great comedy this is! I mean, this is one of the funniest comedies I've ever seen. This is a movie that. I saw it. I saw it in theaters. I think on opening day, actually, because I because this was still when I was in high school. I didn't have to go to school, so I think we went to one of the first showings on that Friday when this came out. But um, it's a movie that I remember laughing as a kid, as a kid, as a kid watching it. Then it still makes me laugh twenty years later. And the story, you kind of figure it out what it is. You have a group of unlikely misfits who enter a Las Vegas dodgeball tournament in the hopes of winning fifty thousand dollars to save their cherished local gym from being taken over by corporate health fitness chain Global Gym. Uh, led by, um, um, uh, 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 I can't remember his name now, uh, White, I just, I say this is one of my favorite comedies of all time, and I can't remember who Ben Stiller is, White Goodman, Ben Stiller plays White Goodman, and, uh, Peter LaFleur is played by Vince Vaughn, and, um, See, that's the power. That's the power of this. I try to. I'm trying not to look at the screen while I'm trying to remember the name of these people because I've got the Wikipedia page right here just in case I need to look at something here. But I've seen this movie so many times. I should remember the names of these people in this movie. Oh, good lord! But um, yeah, like I said, this is a freaking hilarious movie, man. This is a movie that has such a stacked cast overall. Vince Vaughn, Ben Stiller, they're both very funny in here. Uh, Christine Taylor is very good playing kind of the love interest to, to uh, Vince Vaughn's character. Well, she is a love interest to Vince Vaughn's character, but with a twist at the end, which I will not spoil if you have not seen the movie, because it's actually pretty hilarious how they handle it. You know, you got a bunch of different character actors that you are very familiar with. This is one of Justin Long's early film roles. Uh, Steven Root, of course, from the, from the King of the Hill. Alan Tudyk, who's going to have a really good year in 2004 because he's not only got this, but he'll be starring in iRobot the following month. Uh, Rip Torn is absolutely great as as um, um, Patches of uh, Hank Azaria has a great little cameo. Missy Pyle uh, f f plays one of the characters from Global Gym. Uh, Joel David Moore, Julie Gonzalo, uh, a lot of cameos in here. You know, Gary Cole and Jason Bateman, who are very funny as the announcers of ESPN 8, The Ocho, uh, Curtis Armstrong, Patton Oswalt's in this as well, Roy Beth Denver from all that, William Shatner, there's cameos all over the place. Lance Armstrong has a cameo, Chuck Norris, David Hasselhoff. David Hasselhoff's going to have a pretty good year in 2004, too. He's got two memorable cameos in two great movies, this and the SpongeBob movie, which we'll get to later on, but... Um, there really is not much more I can say about this movie that hasn't already been said. It's freaking hilarious. Has some of the most memorable lines that that you can always remember every time you go back back to it. Like the whole, especially Jason Bateman. I think this is this was also in a year where Jason Bateman was kind of stepping about, stepping back from that character that we saw back in the '80s with him and stuff like Silver Spoons and Nature Move, and like these and the, you know he's growing his he's growing his character out. And becoming more, becoming known as this great comedic actor because he was in Starsky and Hutch. He'd been a couple, he'd been a couple other movies later on down the road in the month, this in the year. And it was another movie for the frat pack people too. This was still when the frat pack was slowly but surely beginning to build their great, their great stretch going into the rest of the decade. But um, the movie is just so hilarious. It's so funny. It's a very formulaic plot, yes, but. What they do to make you laugh in this movie, because that's the whole purpose of the movie, is that to simply make you laugh out loud. And there are moments in here that are so goddamn hilarious that I can't. Like, there's there's too many things in this movie to really, to really like. I'd be I'd be sitting here for an, over an hour talking about all the great things about this movie in general. This is just a f movie that is just so well done. It's a film that knows exactly what it's trying to be. It knows exactly what it's trying to accomplish, and. It just it just knows exactly how to have a good time. It can be really stupid at times, but the stupidity plays into part of the fun, man. I mean, that's just this is just a classic, classic movie. What more can I say about this film that hasn't already been said? Dodgeball, a true underdog story, is a terrific film. And you know, 
I'm, they've been talking about doing a sequel for a long period of time, and I think they just said in the last year or so they're going to try to redo this, the pro production of getting a sequel off the ground. But honestly, I really don't want to see a sequel to this. I mean, the first movie works fine on its own. There's really not much more you can do with a sequel to this. I mean, because I feel like they're gonna, if they do a sequel, it'll probably end up being the same thing that happened to Zoolander 2, which was a complete pointless sequel, which just threw in these random cameos that did not make a whole lot of sense. And it's just, I don't know. Like, to me, the first Dodgeball is more than enough. We don't need a sequel. We don't need another film coming more than 20-plus years after the original film. And... Because the track record of comedy sequels 20 plus years later is not good. I mean, like, and it's just, like, I really don't want to see him to, to ruin, what, ruin a great movie that, that works fine on its own as a, as a one no, film, one film in general. But it's like, just stick with one film, go do something else, go some, do something original. Like, give us something new and different. But, um, I, like I said, I love this movie. I really hope they don't make a sequel to this. I really hope this just stays a one movie fil film. But, um, but... Regardless, it's one of the funniest comedies I've ever seen. Dodgeball, a true underdog story. I can't recommend this one enough. If you have not seen it, see it. It is definitely well worth the time. So, uh, speaking of movies that you should see, and definitely should see, let's take a look at the second big new release of the weekend, and that is Steven Spielberg's The Terminal. Steven Spielberg, as a whole, is no doubt one of our great directors. He's made so many great movies in his legendary career. I don't think that even needs to be said at this point. By the way, every director, there's always those couple of movies that always seem to slip away from people's memories. I mean, Francis Ford Coppola, in the 1980s, had a number of these movies because they weren't big financial hits, but they were really good movies overall. I mean, there was a lot of great stuff in the 80s from him. You know, One from the Heart, The Cotton Club, Rumblefish, The Outsiders, T Tucker, The Man in His Dream, Peggy Sue Got Married. And Steven Spielberg is definitely one of those examples of that. And there's, like I said, there's always that couple, those couple of movies that always seem to slip away from people's memories because they weren't big critical hits, they weren't big financial hits. In fact, Spielberg's had a couple of them as of late. The Fablemans of West Side Story were not big financial hits. And they're probably up there with some of his most underrated movies. But this movie here, The Terminal, might just be his most, over, most underrated movie of all time because this is a film that I remember growing up loving. I was really excited to see it in theaters when I was a kid. Is when I was a kid. I think I saw it the same day as Dodgeball. It's just a great, great film. Uh, in, it, in it, you have Tom Hanks playing uh, Victor Nabarsky, who's a man who's being trapped inside of New York's JFK airport terminal when he's denied entry into the United States when the country of Kokosia has gone into war. And uh, at the same time, he can't return to his native country due to the military coup. And it's basically inspired by the story of this 18-year stay by this guy, Miron Karimini Nasiria, I think I'm pronouncing that right, who lived, in, who lived in Terminal 1 of Charles de Gaulle International Airport in Paris, France, from 1988 to 2006. And so after arriving at the airport, he gets unwillingly caught in bureaucratic glitches that make it impossible for him to return to his home country or enter the U.S. now. Uh, caught up in the Richie complex and amusing world inside the airport. He makes friends, gets a job, and finds romance with Catherine Zeta Jones, as you can see, and ultimately discovers America itself. And it's a movie that I've been waiting to talk about for the longest time because this really is one of his best movies. Probably my top ten favorite Steven Spielberg directed movies. I really love this film. I love it for a number of reasons. The premise is great. It's such a clever and interesting concept based off of a real story. And it just leads to so many possibilities of what could be done with this kind of a fascinating story to tell. And this movie definitely delivers on that. And then some. the casting, I think, overall is great, which I think Tom Hanks does a very good job of creating this character, even doing a pretty good foreign accent for a country that was completely made up for this film. So you can't really say that, oh, he offended people from this land of Krakosia. This place doesn't even exist in real life. Um, but, um, it, you know, but I'm just saying, but... Um, like, I love the fact that they had to create... Because one of my favorite movies is That Thing You Do, and Tom Hanks basically had to create his own world of music for that film, because these bands and those bands in that movie basically do not exist in real life. But, um, you know, this is, um, like, this is a film that is, um, you know, it's, it's a great film. Like, it's getting back up... As I'm get, I know I'm getting off the subject here for a little bit, but let's keep going. But uh, Hanks is very good in the film. you got Catherine Zeta-Jones, who works very well. Their chemistry they establish is very well done. I like Stanley Tucci a lot because he's a, he's the antagonist, but he's not really a villain. And I like the fact that he's not played as a villain. Like, he's a guy that's just... He's just do, trying to do his job, and there gets to a point where 
you know, it's it reminds me a lot of the Truman Show, which was very convincing because the same man that wrote this is also the guy that wrote the Truman Show, Andrew Nicole. And in that movie, Ed Harris is kind of seen as the antagonist, but even he kind of realizes that maybe he takes it too far. And I like that in this movie, he does the exact same th thing with Stanley Tucci's character. It's a very good character overall. You get to see great people like uh, Chi McBride, Diego Luna, Eddie Jones, Zoe Saldana, who, of course, went on to become the big star that she's become. This is one of the first, this, I think this was the first film I actually saw her in. Terrific cast overall in this movie. And it does a great job of blending comedy and drama nicely. The dialogue in the movie is pitch perfect. They don't go too far, you know. They don't do. They don't go too far with the whole idea of, you know. There's there's the cliches like you don't get the cliches of like the big third act breakup. There's a moment where, you know, the liar gets revealed, but it's it's immediately like within a few minutes, completely contained. Like it doesn't it doesn't drag the movie out by any means necessary and. A lot of great talent on the writing front here. You've got people like, like I said, Andrew Nicole, who gave us the Truman Show, and Ronan directed Lord of War and Gattaca. Uh, Sasha Gervasi, who directed Hitchcock and the writer of Anvil, the story of Anvil, and Jeff Nathanson, who has, done, has actually written some good, fun movies in general. You know, Rush Hour 2, Catch Me If You Can, uh, criminally underrated stuff like The Last Shot, Tower Heist, you know, even stuff like, uh, even Guilty Pleasures of Mine, Speed 2. He wrote that as well, and he wrote, he wrote Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which I'm sorry to tell you, it's not a bad movie. There has not been a bad, I'm sorry, that's not the, is, if there's one bad Indiana Jones movie, it's Temple of Doom, and I will stick by that until the day I die, damn it. But, um, but I digress. Um, probably my favorite aspect of the movie is that it really was kind of a massive turning point for Steven Spielberg for proving that, you know, he can do, is, he went back to being what we met, what made his career begin what finally got him the Oscar that year in 93 because he can direct these big blockbuster movies and, you know, in that same year he can give us uh, great films, but in the same year he can also give us that great movie. It's a great, much small, much smaller film in general with something like Schindler's List. Like, he proves here that he can direct these great movies that are not blockbusters or high-budget fairs and probably would have been better off with another director and he still makes a really great film out of it. I absolutely love this movie. It's not only Spielberg's most underrated film as a director, but it's definitely one of his best movies as a director as a whole. And there's a lot of people out there I know who have not seen this movie, and I'm telling you folks, you are doing yourself a major, major disservice by not doing so. The Terminal is a great film. Check it out. You will not be disappointed. It's a really damn good film. I can't recommend this one enough. So, All right, so let's go ahead and get to the Mixed Bag Movie of the Weekend, a movie that I thought was... Let, the more I thought about it, it maybe it isn't as bad as I thought it was. It's just more underwhelming than I thought it was. Let's take a look at the last one we have here. Jackie Chan and Steve Coogan and Around the World in 80 Days from Disney. Yes, Disney was the main distributor here in the U.S. because that trailer is completely focusing more on Walden Media, which I think this was actually one of their earliest movies where their name eventually began to, began to take over on a lot of different kids' films. But, um... This is Around the World in 80 Days. This is the film that is based off, of course, the best-selling, the, the, the beloved book by Jules Verne, the 1873 novel, in which you have here, it takes place in the 19th century and centers on Phineas Fogg, played by Steve Coogan, here reimagined as an eccentric inventor in his efforts to circumnavigate the globe in 80 days. And during this trip, he's accompanied by his Chinese valet, played by Jackie Chan. For comedic reasons, the film intentionally de deviated wildly from the novel and included a number of anachronistic elements, uh, including uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger showing up in the movie as as um, the pr Prince Happy, which I I can't remember who he was. Now I can't remember who he was. The Prince of Istanbul, who was actually really funny in the movie. Like that that scene there in the trailer is really good, and he has a lot of really good funny moments in the film. And this is around the time when he was governor of California, so I guess he made this before then. But um, yeah, remember I remember this movie not being that great, but. Going back to it a couple months ago to get ready for this, I gotta say, like, the pieces were definitely there for something very fun in general, but I think a couple things really hold it back. One, the fact that they went all st straightforward comedy, I think really hurts them in the long run. I think the fact that they st went sp so far away from the books, I think really hurts them in the long run. I think this direct, they got uh, Frank Karachi, who did The Water Boy, and would later do Click after this, and he also did The Wedding Singer, too. A good director overall, but I just don't feel like he had a good enough script to really work with here. You got three writers here who I don't know too much about because two of the guys here, I barely see any works by them. And uh, 
The first guy, David Titcher, is more known for creating the show The Librarian, which is basically kind of like a TNT knockoff of Indiana Jones in a way, which uh, that show also included Bob Newhart, which, by the way, today he died, so uh, rest in peace, Bob Newhart. But um, getting off topic there for a second. But I also think the movie also really failed because... It doesn't have that big cast that these a story like this should have. I mean, there's big names in it. Like I said, Jackie Chan, Steve Coogan, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, you've got uh, Cecile de France from High Tension, Jim Broadbent, Ewan Brenner, um, Mark Addy's also in here, Kathy Bates, John Cleese, Richard Branson's also in the movie as well, uh, Rob Schneider, Luke Wilson, Owen Wilson, um, Macy Gray for some reason. This was around the time when people were trying to make her the next big thing. Uh, Will Forte, I think this was pre-Saturday Night Live, or just when he was starting on Saturday Night Live, if I'm, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. But, I don't know, like, there's a, there was another version that NBC did back, in, a miniseries version with Pierce Brosnan, and I think that had a big cast in general here. I think they really should have just went all out with this and just gone with a huge cast. I mean, it's produced by, it's co-produced by Disney. It, you, you mean to tell me that Disney won't put all that mo more money into getting more bigger names in this piece it's put, put, put more, they put more money into Home on the Range than they did with this movie. That should tell you something right there. Like, um, but then again, this was in that this was in that second half of the tenure of Michael Eisner, where you know, go for cheap and pretend to make it seem like it's much bigger than it has any intentions to be. But I don't know. Like, there's definitely a lot of pieces there where this probably could have worked. I really do think that this really could have worked better if they had more of a bigger budget to it, if there was more of an ensemble to it. A, bi an, a bigger, high-profile ensemble to it. If they tried to go more closer to the books, there is a great movie in here somewhere, and I feel like somebody out there will eventually make a great movie adaptation of the storyline, where it can be not just an action adventure, but also a comedy as well. We're going to see some of the other versions of Around the World in 80 Days that have been done um, since this movie came out, and there was one that went to th there was one that was a, like an animated movie that you would probably see in a Walmart direct to D five dollar DVD bin which looks pretty bad, but there's also one with uh, David Tennant that's on B a TV series that's on the, B I think it's on the BBC, which has gotten some good reviews to it, so maybe there is a good adaptation, modern adaptation of this out there, I just haven't found it, but, um, but yeah, like I said, this is a movie that could have, e that definitely could have been a whole lot better, this is a film that could have easily been a film that really should have been a lot bigger and a lot more ambitious than they could have been, but, um, the end result is just a film that has a lot more potential to it that just doesn't really live up to what it could have been. And it's a shame because the pieces are definitely there. There are some promising elements to it, but just a botched movie in general and a film that could have probably, like I said, could have been a whole lot better, but as it is, just really isn't a great film in general. It's one that I would say is not bad, but it definitely could have been a whole lot better with the stuff that could have been done with it. So that's Around the World in 80 Days. And so on that note, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. And the next time we meet, we've got four movies to wrap up the month of June, including the most controversial movie of the year, and that is Michael Moore's hit documentary, Fahrenheit 9-11. And we've also got a movie, another controversial movie, maybe not controversial, as controversial as Fahrenheit 9-11, but yeah. For, yeah, Keaton Ivy Wayne's is the Wayans brothers as white chicks. I mean, that's controversial in itself, but it ends up being a huge hit for some reason. But also we've got uh, Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams in the in Nicholas Sparks' The Notebook, and also Freddie Highmore in The Adventure, The Bro Two Brothers. And uh, so an overall big weekend of, of movies to look at next time around. We will delve into all those films all on the next episode. But until then, thank you so much for watching. And if you want to see more videos like this, uh, please hit the playlist on the next page. Check out the previous episode, and also don't forget to hit the like and subscribe button if you want to see more videos like this on this channel. So. With that said, I'm off. I will see you guys next time, and until then, as always, take care.